Hello, my friends. Welcome back as we continue our sermon series on tough topics. Today, we have another really tough topic. How do we as Christians understand what God says about homosexuality in the Bible? And then how do we relate to the LGBTQ plus community because of that? There's some really harsh things that are said in the Bible about homosexuality, but we know that God is a God of love. So what do we do with that? Let's go ahead and dive into this together. But before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray right now that you will lead and guide our conversation, that you will bless us, that you will show us your heart, that you will show us how to love and how to understand this difficult topic. And Lord, I just pray that as we process this together, that you will speak to our hearts and minds, that you will open things up for us and make them clear. And Lord, I just pray right now that you bless our time together. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. So as we start this conversation, first I want to remind us of something about Jesus. So if you remember when we looked at was Jesus God, we looked at John chapter 1 where it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus, um, he was God, he was with God, he's been there from the beginning, and Jesus became flesh and lived among us. But in John chapter 1 verse 14, here's what's interesting that it says, So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. That's how the New Living Translation translates it. But it says in a little asterisk, if you go down and read at the bottom of the page, instead of saying unfailing love and faithfulness, it should say grace and truth. That's what the original language says, is grace and truth. Jesus came and lived among us and he was full of grace and truth. And we have seen the glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. And then in verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but God's grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so we understand that there is law set forth, but that Jesus fully explains the spirit of the law. Like we learned last time as we were looking at adultery, you know, Jesus said, you know, Moses permitted you to commit divorce. But I say, if you look at someone lustfully, you've committed adultery already. So God raises the bar so much higher that we all stand in need of him. What we're being told in John chapter one is Jesus has this way that he is full of grace. He's come to show us the spirit, the fullness of God's love. It's not in contrast to the law, but it fully explains God's law and that Jesus is full of grace and truth. So Jesus, as we look at how Jesus dealt with things, we need to understand that Jesus didn't hide from the difficult truths. He didn't say things were okay that weren't okay. And when we as a church look at this conversation about the LGBTQ community, there's camps that people settle in. There's um, the supportive camp. So we have to be 100% supportive and we're just going to dismiss the things that the Bible says is old fashioned and out of date and not in context anymore because we serve a God of love. Or there's the other camp that's going to alienate everyone who's in the LGBTQ community because they are sinners and the Bible says some really harsh things and they can't um, see that. And so therefore, and so there tends to be these two camps, either we are supportive and we agree with them and go ahead, go for it, or we're going to alienate them. But Jesus has a third way. His third way is to come live among us. It tells us in Luke that Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. So Jesus is on a mission to come and connect with us, but he's here to tell us truth. But he does it in a loving, graceful, kind manner. And so we need to really wrap our heads around that as we're starting this conversation. So what is the truth? What is God's original purpose and his original plan for sexuality, for marriage, for love to take place in that married relationship? What is God's plan for that? So long before sin ever happened and before there was anything such as homosexuality or the LGBTQ community, we have Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But even before they existed, it's important for us to understand God's thinking and what is going on here. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to start reading in verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image. So the New Living Translation, which I love to read, is very politically correct. So it doesn't want to leave anybody out. So it will often make things plural when the original language does not have them plural. 
and in certain instances it's okay because that's the general meaning anyways in other instances we need to pay attention to this and usually the new living translation will put an asterisk and let you know that it's updated something or changed something like that so when we look at this passage in the new living translation it says then god said let us make human beings that should say man so god said let us say make man in our image to be like us all right, so the first thing we need to understand that human beings, the whole human race was created in God's image to be like him, to be reflectors of God's image. So that when we are looked at, especially in our marriage relationship, we are seeing the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the love that exists among themselves. And they are one and three all at the same time, and they love. There's this fullness and a completeness. And so God, as the crowning act of creation, decides to make humans, and he says, let us make man in our image to be like us. So not only are we supposed to reflect God, but in the perfect world, we are supposed to be like God. What was God? God is the ruler of the universe. God set Adam and Eve up to rule. So here's what he said. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, and all the animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. All right, so God's like, we're going to set them up. They're going to be in our image, and they're going to be like us. They're going to rule. And so then how does God do that? Moses in this beautiful little poem, here's what he says. So God created human beings or God created man singular in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So what Moses does in this little poem is he describes the process of creation that we read in further detail in Genesis chapter two. So God first creates Adam. Adam is awake for a while and then he names all the animals and he realizes that something is missing. He is not complete. As he's looked at all the animals going around and he's going dogs and cows and giraffes and alligators and you name it, um, he realizes that everyone has a pair. Uh, there is a male and a female of each one, but then when he looks at himself, he's feeling incomplete. And that's when God makes Eve. And so in this beautiful poem, that's what Moses describes. But it's in order for us to understand God's image. So God created humans in his image, but in order to fully understand the image of God, it takes male and female. And part of that is because of what is said next. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. And so here we have at the beginning of creation, God says as his crowning act of creation, he's going to make human beings in his own image to be like him, to reflect him. And so he makes Adam, but Adam is incomplete by himself. He doesn't fully reflect God's image. And so together... Eve is then created, and together Adam and Eve reflect God's image. They reflect back who he is, the love that he has for himself in this trinity. And there's this beautiful thing. And so God says they're going to be like us. They're going to rule over the whole world. Um, Adam and Eve gave that up when they sinned, and then Satan became the rightful ruler of the world, and then Jesus bought that back with his life. Um, but Adam and Eve were supposed to rule, and they're supposed to be creators, the only way we can create is male and female together. Um, just like God was a creator, he gives us the gift of creation in the marriage relation, taking male and female. So when God created man, when he created Adam and Eve, when he created humans, there was only two options. There is just 100% um, woman and 100% man. And I've heard it said that those are the only two options that we still have today. But my friends, if we honestly look at genetics and if we look at what sin has done to humans, there are many people who aren't 100% male in their genetics and there's many people who aren't 100% female in their genetics. They're on a continuum basis. And then there's all sorts of other crazy things that sin has done. An example of that is sometimes when a mother is pregnant, she will have fraternal twins, meaning they're from different eggs. Sometimes a male egg and a female egg that will merge in utero and create one baby. 
And so there are people who are born who have two sets of DNA and one of them is a male set of DNA and the other one is a female set of DNA. Someone could have a male brain but female sex organs. And because of that, because of sin, because of the degradation of sin, we aren't playing on the same plane. We are not in the same position as Adam and Eve were back then. But we need to understand that God in his fullness, his original plan and his desire was for people to be 100% woman or 100% man and for us to marry in a heterosexual monogamous relationship that we would stay with for the rest of eternity and that our love for each other would be a reflection of God's love for himself and a reflection on the world. That we would then be like God, that we would rule over the world around us, which we lost with sin, and that we would be many creators. We would create other babies and we would continue the human race by filling the world and multiplying. And so this is God's original plan. Unfortunately, we know in Genesis chapter 3, it doesn't take very long that sin comes in and it wrecks God's plan. And the effects of sin have not just affected our sinful natures, it hasn't just affected our world, it has also affected our DNA. It has affected everything that God designed and made perfect in creation. And so how does God understand and how do we process what happens to us um, because of sin and the sexuality, peace, and everything else? I want us to look at a few verses. First of all, I'd like us to look at Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. It says, Do not practice homosexuality. Having sex with another man as with a woman. It is a detestable sin. Or Leviticus 20, verse 13, which says, If a man practices homosexuality, having sex with another man as with a woman, both the man have committed a detestable act. They must be put to death for they are guilty of a capital offense. So if we look at this, just by the time of the Exodus, when the children of Israel have come out of Egypt, there's also this degradation of God's original plan. So God's original plan was for a man and a woman to be in a married relationship and to be bone to bone. And what God has joined together, no one should separate. That's what Jesus says. And by the time we get here, we're looking at homosexuality, but sometimes we pick out these verses and we forget to read all the verses around them. And all the verses around them in Leviticus basically say, don't have sex with your sister or your mother or your aunt. Don't have sex with your daughter or your granddaughter. Don't have sex with an animal. Don't have sex. Like it, it basically lays down all of the ways that we have perverted God's original plan. You see, and I think the sexual sins are so deep because we, it through our sexuality, through marriage, we are supposed to be reflecting God's image. And so Satan is trying desperately to pervert God's image. He's trying desperately for us to go off on another path. So these things, when Moses is writing the law, he says, these are detestable. This is not okay. This is not okay in God's eyes. And these are corporate sins. And my friends, this is hard. It's really hard for us to grapple with because we we know that God loves us. We know that God loves everybody. He even loves people who identify other than male or female or who have a different sexual orientation. So how do we process these passages? So let's jump over to the book of Romans where Paul is writing to the church in Rome. And the church in Rome is filled with a whole bunch of Christians, but the church in Rome isn't majority Jewish Christians. There is a lot of Gentile Christians, and there's a lot of debate and argument back and forth between the Gentiles and the Jewish Christians on what was right and what was not right. The Jewish Christians wanted the Gentile Christians to adopt all of their customs, their Jewish customs, in order to become Christian, and they didn't think they needed to do all those things. And so Paul writes this book, and the purpose of the book of Romans is to let us all know that we are all broken and in need of Jesus, that we are all in need of the Savior, and we all pretty much come from the same position. So Paul greets the church in Rome, and he talks about a few things. So I want to start reading in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. So in verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. In verses 3 and 4, Paul had already explained that the good news was Jesus came and died for us and was raised to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and therefore, God had a call in Paul's life as well as our lives that we're supposed to share the good news with other people. Paul continues, it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. 
So what Paul is saying is that it is the power of God that saves us. It is the power of God that makes us right with Christ. It's this good news. It's Jesus' death for our sins and his resurrection that offers us salvation. There's absolutely nothing we can do to earn salvation. In verse 17, this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that the righteous person has life. So in other words, Paul lays out before he continues on, He's saying, hey, guess what? I am called to share the good news. God has shared it with me and it is my call to share. And the good news is that we are saved start to finish by faith in Jesus Christ, by grace because of what Jesus has done for us in his death on the cross. And it's only our faith in what God can do in and through us. And when we surrender ourselves to God, that's how we are able to live a righteous life. So the only way we can live a righteous life is by faith in Jesus Christ, letting him take control. Then Paul continues, and here's where he starts talking about what has frustrated God, the process of sin and how it has affected our world. In verse 18, but God showed his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. So God is frustrated with wicked people because by their wickedness, they are suppressing the truth. And the truth is God's love, his grace, the redemption. And he's saying, hey, listen, nobody has an excuse because if we look around in nature, we will see that there is a divine being that is responsible for this, we can see his invisible qualities, that there is a divine force behind all of this. And so he's saying it makes God angry because wicked people choose to suppress the truth of God by their actions even though they have seen, they have clearly had opportunity to know that there is a divine God. There's someone more powerful out there than them that they should be looking for, trying to get to know. So if we look starting in Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve knew God. They literally would stand in the garden with him and talk to him every evening, which was amazing. And after sin, they were kicked out of the garden, but they still could see the garden. They could see the angel standing there to guard the tree. And so the knowledge of God was there and they passed down the stories. And as they're passing down the stories, evil begins to grow all around them because men are choosing to do what they want to do instead of following God's plan. And so God gets sick and tired of this and he decides to wipe out the whole earth with the flood. He chooses Noah, who is a righteous man. And there's, by the time Noah's finished building the ark, there's only eight righteous people that live on the earth. All of the other people who love God have died and everyone else is truly wicked to the core. They will not accept God's grace. And so God saves the animals and Noah and his three sons and their wives. Shortly after the flood is over, sin begins to erupt again. And that's what is being described here. It says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him or even give him thanks. They began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. So instead of thinking of what God wanted them to do, they started thinking, oh, God's just, he's no fun. He's not going to let me do what I want to do. God's way isn't going to be beneficial. I won't be as successful. And so they started making up these ideas about what was God like. And these ideas very much mimic what Satan thought about God at the very beginning. That God isn't loving because he won't give me what I want. And what I want is to be God and he won't let me be God. Um, in their wickedness, even though they knew God, they'd seen God. They'd had live testimony of people who had seen God. God. They have seen these amazing things happen, the flood. They decide not to lean into God. And because of that, the wickedness grows around them. So what happens when we start thinking um, all of these inappropriate things about God? We start making up what God's like, oh, he's just an exacting judge, or he doesn't want me to have any fun. Or if I do things his way, it's not going to work out for me. And so God is just mean. He's just, God isn't really there. It tells us that their minds become dark and confused. In verse 22, claiming to be wise, they instead become utter fools. Instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. As sin is running rampant in the world, what is happening is people's understanding and concept of who God is is getting warped and twisted. Instead of worshiping the living God, they start making idols. 
and then praying to the idols that they made as if they can help them somehow. And they become utter fools. They don't understand God anymore. And because they keep pushing God away and in their darkness and their confusion, God allows them to continue to run in their foolishness. In verse 24, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. When we keep pushing God away, the result of sin is that God is going to let us. He's going to let us choose to not understand him. He's going to let us choose to go away from him. And he's going to let us make choices that aren't good for us, that are not in line with his plans for us. And so how do they do this? They start doing awful, degrading, vile things with their bodies. Now, if you look at a literature from this time, if you look at the pagan cults, if you look at what was happening, there was horrific sexual deeds, not just homosexuality. There was awful things that were happening all throughout culture. Paul can't bring himself to mention them all. He can't bring himself to describe them all. And so what does he say? They traded the truth about God for a lie. The truth about God is that he's a loving creator who wants what's best for us, who the good news, the truth that Paul was talking about earlier was Jesus came to die for us so that he could offer us salvation by faith in him so that we could be like him. So instead of knowing all of that, they shared the truth about God for a lie. They believe all these things. They worshiped and served things God created instead of worshiping the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even women turned against the natural way of having sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And men, instead of having normal sexual relationships with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves a penalty they deserved. So what is God saying here? He's saying that his original plan for love in marriage was male and female. And because sin got into this and because of the depravity of sin and the way that Satan messed this up, Satan begins to warp those things. And he says that people gave up what was natural for what was unnatural. As we look at this holistically, there's a few things that we need to pay attention here. First of all, the idea that sin comes in and says, what I think, what I feel is better than what God says and what God feels and what God's purpose is. And what I want or what I lust after is more important to follow and to go after than to follow what God has said for me to do. But there's also the idea of giving up what is natural for what is unnatural. In the very beginning, God created just male and female. So what would be unnatural was for a woman to sleep with a woman or for a man to sleep with a man. That was not God's natural design. But because of sin, not only have our desires changed, but our DNA has changed too. And in the process of our DNA change, because people are on the spectrum, and like I mentioned earlier in the case of people who legitimately have two sets of DNA, one is male and one is female, what is natural for a person like that? In cases like that, what we need to do is point people back instead of their lustful desires, point them back to a relationship with God and let God help them navigate through what does it mean to honor you and to honor your original plan? What does it mean for me to be faithful to you? What does it mean for me to live for you? Instead, what is happening here, which is sinful, is people are going after what they desire. They know what God tells them to do. They just don't like it. And so they're pushing it aside and they're choosing to follow their lusts and their passions and my friend this is dangerous and this is sinful this is God not God's plan and not God's way so when we look at this there are some people because of the generations of sin that the sins of the fathers are passed down to the third and fourth generation because God has not been in those things there are some people their DNA is affected because of generations of sin and they did not choose this but because of the sin in their body doesn't mean that they are sinful in and of themselves because they have different thought processes or different inclinations or because their DNA, they have two sets of DNA and they're messed up and stuff like that. That does not in and of 
itself makes someone sinful. It's how they choose to respond in their life and what they choose to do, whether they're willing to lean into a relationship with God and prayerfully study God's word, study what he said, study his original plan, study his plan for their lives and let him help them navigate how to be obedient to him. So if you are on the spectrum and you're not 100% male, maybe you're a masculine woman or a feminine man, or you were born with the attraction to the same sex, like those things don't have to define you. And what's beautiful here is we are not saved by our sexuality. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So when Jesus comes in, we get to be saved and he covers all of our brokenness. So I might not have been born with an attraction for women, but alcoholism runs in my family. Anger runs in my family. There's a whole bunch of other things that run in my family. And Jesus, as we talked about last week, he said, if you're angry with someone, it's like you committed murder. Like all of these other sins run in my family. So I have to be surrendered to those just like someone who might be born with DNA that's messed up needs to surrender to God and let God help them navigate what is appropriate and how for they should be living their lives. The sin comes in when we act based on our lust and our desires without surrendering them to Jesus. That's when sin comes in. So we continue reading verse 28. Since they thought it was foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do the things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. They disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless. They have no mercy, and they know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyways. Worse yet, they encourage other people to do them too. So, as we read this passage, many people get caught up in the fact that God says when we just let our desires and our lusts of things we want control us, that it leads to sexual sin. And yes, it does lead to sexual sin because Satan wants to pervert the image of God so bad. He doesn't want us to understand God and who he is. He tries to mess up marriages. He tries to mess up the value of life. He tries to mess up God's image any way he possibly can. But what Paul says, as you continue reading in verse 28, that's not the only way our lustful desires play out in sin. It also plays out in greed, hate, gossip, disobeying our parents, in lack of love, all of these things. And so my friends, what we need to be careful on is we nitpick on different things that God said is sinful. And my friends, it is not sinful to be born a certain way. It is sinful for us to choose our desires over surrender to God. That is what is sinful. So it's not sinful for me to be born with alcoholic tendencies. It is sinful for me to choose my desires over what God is telling me to do. It's not sinful for me to be born with same sex attraction. It is sinful for me to choose my desires over what God has called me to do. And then my friends, it's further complicated because DNA, I can't give up something that I don't have. So if I'm not 100% woman, I can't give up being 100% woman. So like, who am I supposed to be attracted to? What am I supposed to do with that? And so um, for people, because of sin, because their DNA is messed up, we don't have the answer to that. God never specifically talks about that in the Bible. And so we can't talk about that either. What we need to know is what is sin is me choosing my lust, my desires over God's way, over surrender to God and letting God lead and guide my life. And so God says it comes out in sexual sin and it also comes out in a whole bunch of other sins as well. And Paul is talking to the church in Rome and he's talking about the Gentiles and the Jews are going, absolutely, they're all horrific and they're awful. Because what we like to do is we like to look at the other people who are sinning, but we are good. But my friends, we need to keep reading in chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad. And you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do the very same things. And we know that God, in his justice, will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing the same things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? 
Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sins? And so I love this part because as we look at this and what Paul's talking about homosexuality, that it is a deviation from God's original plan, that Satan is trying to mess up the image of God and make us not understand him. And what he's saying is when we choose our lust, our way of thinking, our desires over surrender to God and letting him lead us and let us navigate through the very realities of sin in our lives, then we are sinning. And then Paul is saying, hey, you Jewish Christians, you think you condemn them, but you can't. And so Jesus is talking here and Paul is talking to each one of us. It's really easy to look at the LGBTQ community and go, oh, they're sinning. My friends, you don't know their DNA. You don't know where they are. You don't know their history. You don't know their understanding of God. You don't know anything like that. And so Paul is saying, be real careful about condemning because you're doing the same things. You might not struggle with homosexuality, but you might struggle with anger or murder or gossip or pride or a whole list of other sins that you are not surrendered to God for. So be really careful. And he says, don't you understand God's grace and his kindness? He started this conversation off by saying, we are, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And then he's saying, don't you understand how wonderfully patient and kind God is so that we would turn. And so God's desire isn't that we would stay in our sin, but that as he continues to give us grace, that we would realize our sin and turn to him and ask him for forgiveness and ask him to help us navigate and to lead us as we continue to navigate these very difficult and sinful things in our lives. And so when we think about the conversation about the LGBTQ community and homosexuality, the truth is that that was not God's plan. That, that wasn't even an option in creation. God created 100% male and 100% female. And we are supposed to reflect God's image and reflect who he is. But because of sin, a whole bunch of stuff has happened. Our DNA has changed and the Bible never directly addresses how does something like that, how, what is natural, what is something like that. So all we know to do is to point those people to Jesus. We need to point those people to Jesus so that he can help them navigate the realities of their sin. And then as they are with Jesus, walking with Jesus in a life of surrender, as he leads them to make decisions, we are not to condemn because we are just as sinful in other ways and we need to understand that where God is offering them grace and forgiveness he is offering us grace and forgiveness and we should be thankful for that and so my friends I want us to wrap up by looking at a few different things on how does Jesus treat um, the others in society tax collectors and sinners and the most the lowest of the societies the people who weren't considered valuable at all were drawn to Jesus so what does Jesus say? There's some advice he gives us. And as we look, it gives us a lot of understanding and how we should relate to the LGBTQ community. First of all, he tells us in Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as a dinner guest, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Jesus heard this and said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So what is Jesus saying here? Matthew, a tax collector, invites Jesus over to his house with a whole bunch of other tax collectors who are seen as the bottom of the barrel in Jewish society, but other notorious sinners were there too. And we don't know who they were. Maybe there were some homosexuals in the crowd. Maybe there, we don't know what was going on. But what does Jesus say? Jesus, he isn't shying away from the community. He's not alienating them. Instead, he is going to hang out with them. He is going to spend time with them. He is a friend of them. He is a friend of sinners. And Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. And here he tells the scribes and the Pharisees when they're like, why are you hanging out with such scum? Jesus is like, you know, healthy don't need a doctor. It's a sick people do. So 
So many times Jesus spent time with the broken and sick people in the world because they needed to know that there was a God of love who called them to something higher. If we look at the story from last week in John chapter 8, where the woman who was caught in the act of adultery is brought to Jesus, Jesus says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. So many times we want to reverse that, go and sin no more, and then I won't condemn you. Then I can hang out with you. When you have your life together, it's okay. But Jesus doesn't do that. He goes and he hangs out with broken people. He's friends with broken people. And broken people are drawn to Jesus. And it really infuriates the scribes and Pharisees. But my friends, we need to take a page out of Jesus' life. And we need to not be seen as necessarily approving of the LGBTQ lifestyle because we can't judge. We can't judge whether they're actively sinning or they're somehow following God in the mess of it all because of DNA and everything else. We just can't judge. Some of those things are bigger than us. We know it wasn't part of God's original plan. We know that when we follow just our lustful desires, that is sinning, but we don't know a hundred percent. And so God didn't call us to condemn. He called us to be a friend. And the purpose of being a friend is so that he could offer healing. Jesus showed up and he was a true friend. He really cared because he said, hey, it's not those who think they're righteous that need a doctor. It's those who know they're sinners. These people often know they're sinners. They know that they're missing something. And so Jesus is saying, hey, hang out with the least of these. Be their friends. And so instead of alienating the LGBTQ community, instead of affirming, okay, do whatever you want to because God has got to love. No, we have to acknowledge the truth. And the truth is that is not God's original plan. The truth is sin has affected truly our DNA. The truth is the Bible does not address how we deal with that question. And the truth is when we follow our lustful desires, we are sinning. But when we live a life surrendered to Jesus, he will help us navigate all of that. That is the truth. And if I come alongside and truly care about someone and if I point them to Jesus because he is patient and he is kind and he can help us figure out the muddy mess that is our lives that is the truth and so Jesus says hey listen I'm a friend of tax collectors and sinners and you as the church you should be friends of tax collectors and sinners too in Luke 15 1 Jesus is again accused of hanging out with tax collectors and sinners in Luke 15 1 it says tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach my friends, there is power in that. When we condemn people, when we think we're better than people, when we think that we've got it all figured out and they're horrible and they're sinful and we're good, they don't want to come hang out with us. They don't want to come listen to us teach. They don't want to come learn from us. Jesus cared enough. He truly was friends with people so that he had the opportunity to influence them. He didn't condone behavior that wasn't in line with God's plan, but he loved people. He knew that sin affects all of us deeply to the core. That's what it tells us in Romans chapter eight. We're either controlled by our sinful nature, which leads us to death, or we can be controlled by the life-giving spirit of God who frees us. We don't have to surrender to our sinful nature anymore. God can lead us in a different way that is full of life and grace and forgiveness and salvation. And so Jesus in John 15, tax collectors and other notorious sinners are drawn to Jesus. They come to listen to him teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them the story. If a man had a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will carry it on home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over the 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. What Jesus is saying is so profound and so powerful. He teaches in such a way that sinners are drawn to him. And when the Pharisees are angry about that, they come and they say, Jesus, this is not okay. And Jesus says, let me tell you a story. And he says, hey, listen, there's a sheep that wanders away. 99 stay. They're safe. They're in the pen. They're good. And what does Jesus do? He leaves the righteous. He leaves those who've got it figured out. And he goes looking for the lost. My friends, Jesus is in active search of broken people. And when he finds them, instead of saying, get up, get your act together. Come on. Why'd you go away from me? How come you're sinning? How come you're doing this stuff? No, what Jesus does is he picks the sheep up and carries it on his shoulders back home. 
My friends, is that how the LGBTQ community views Christians? As friends who are out searching for them because we desire their good and their salvation? Do they view us as someone who wants to carry them to Jesus? Are we praying for the people in our lives that we can see that they might not be in line with what God's original plan was? Are we carrying them to Jesus? Are we praying them through? Are we truly friends? My friends, Jesus tells us in John that by your love, the world will know that you are my disciples. As we look at this topic, what we need to wrap our heads around is, yes, there are some pretty straightforward and hard to deal with scriptures on homosexuality. God says it is not his plan. But when we look at the holistic picture, we understand that God's original plan was male and female. We were supposed to reflect God's image. We were supposed to be like God. And Satan wants to mar that so bad. And so what he's done is he gets in people's minds and he starts telling them lies about God. And when they start believing it, the darkness comes in and they start not understanding. But the whole time God has been there showing us who he is. And the whole time, God had the plan of salvation in place. And what is sinful is not that sin has affected our DNA and some of us have propensities or some of us are born with two sets of DNA or male and female or some of us are born with multiple sex organs and, you know, who should I decide to be? Like, that's for God to figure out. That is not for any human to figure out. That is for God and we point people to God. But what is sinful is when I choose my desires, my way over God's way, that is what becomes sinful. So how are we as the church supposed to respond to the LGBTQ community? We are supposed to respond like Jesus. We are to be their friends. Jesus doesn't condone sin, but he doesn't condemn it. Instead, he calls them to more. Jesus is full of grace and truth. He tells them the truth in love and he points them to Jesus, a saving relationship. Jesus goes out of his way so that sinners were drawn to Jesus. Jesus says, hey, listen, I'm here for people who know they need me, not people who've got it figured out. Jesus says, I go searching for the lost and I do the heavy work. I carry them home. And so my friends, instead of offering condemnation or anything else, how about we offer the redemption story? How about we tell the good news? How about we are truly friends? How about we are known like Jesus as friends of the LGBTQ community? Not because we say it was God's original plan or say that God's okay to it all, because we can't do that. that. We are not God. But because God has told us to love, God has told us to walk with broken people, and God has told us not to condemn because all of us are broken in our own ways, some just not quite as visible as others. My friends, this doesn't answer everything, but what I know and what I believe is that God loves everyone in the LGBTQ community and people in that community are hurting way more and often because of the church. And so we as God's people need to do better. We need to be friends of sinners. We need to seek and to save the lost like Jesus did. We need to be praying them back and praying for them and praying that they will live a life of surrender. And we need to trust God to navigate these people's lives. And my friends, I want to tell you something that might shock you. There are gonna be a lot of people who lived active gay lifestyles who will be in heaven because we can't judge where they're at. We can't judge how God is working with them and what he's doing that is not on us to judge. But we also can't say that we know it's okay. And so my friend, this is the tough truth, but the reality is, is we have a God of love that the whole time had the plan of salvation. And we are saved not by our sexuality, not by the good works that we do, not by anything else. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that I can say amen to. My friends, what has God said to you as you've processed these passages with me today? I really would love to know. Would you take a minute and grab your connection cards? You can do that by texting the letter CC to 301-321-8848. And let me know, what did God say to you? What really stood out to you in these passages? And then second, how are you going to respond to God? God desires a response. He has a relationship with us on purpose because he wants a conversation. He wants us to respond. So how are you going to respond? 
And lastly, how can we pray for you? And how can we pray for maybe the people who are struggling in your life? Let's do that together. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to pray right now that you will lead and guide us. Lord, I pray first that you forgive us of our sins. Forgive us corporately as a church for the hurt that we have done to the LGBTQ community in condemning them instead of pointing them to you, instead of carrying them to you on our shoulders through prayer, instead of loving them the same way you did. So Lord, please forgive us of that. Lord, show us um, your way and show us personally how not to surrender to our lust and our desires, but to see a clear image of who you are and to present everything to you in a posture of surrender. And Lord, show us what that looks like in our everyday lives. Lord, I pray that as we encounter the LGBTQ community, I pray that you teach us how to love, how to be a friend and how to point them to you. And Lord, help us not to condemn because we are all broken and affected by sin. And so Lord, I just pray that you be with everyone today and show us how to move forward. And Lord, I just pray that you continue to speak to us and lead us. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us today. This sermon would have aired at six o'clock on Friday evening, and you can join us live for discussions of these same passages on Saturday morning. You can join us in three different ways. First of all, at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, you can join us in our Herndon location at 1090 Sterling Road in Herndon, Virginia, or you can join us at noon in our Chantilly location at 14595 Avion Parkway in Chantilly, Virginia. During our noon service, you can also join us on Zoom for an interactive service, and you can get the Zoom links by texting the word study to 301-321-8848. I hope you all will join us and that you'll come open and ready to hear God's heart. Have a wonderful day.